I try to um, prepare this lecture so that uh, I can uh, you can uh, learn as much as possible about carbon, about radiocarbon. This is what I've been doing for 25 years already, and uh, I can tell you, uh, as with your art, I never get bored with radiocarbon. So I hope you can see the excitement that is coming from this uh, from this tool. I call it tool, great tool for dating. I say old and young. This somehow fits to this Asian uh, art fair because we have this two opposite uh, sides of carbon coming together. And I want to explain to you how it comes together. Um, then after that I will show you some examples of uh, our work, our studies that might illustrate problems and also benefits of radiocarbon. Uh, here you have a, a web page of, of uh, my institute, my group, where you can also uh, go back and see everything what we do. We do, we do various interesting studies. So this is the content of uh, my lecture. I will uh, try to explain what is the old, what is the young carbon, how uh, does it come together and then uh, the basic of radiocarbon and as I said examples of young and old, old and young. Okay, here why are we talking about old carbon? Because um, as I was preparing this lecture <laughs> I found the line which is in my head for many years and m many of you know that song of Woodsco Woodstock 69. We are a billion years old carbon. We come from the stars. We are uh, the carbon in us is formed in galaxies, in stars, which are maybe not exploding like this crab nebula. I see that uh, research, recent research shows that actually that carbon in us, uh, in all living uh, organism, is coming from the stars which are dying slowly. This is what we know now. The Crab Nebula is another connection to uh, carbon, this time to young carbon. It's just illustration. Where does the young carbon come from? It comes also from out there from the universe because it is produced by cosmic radiation that is created in those explosions. The stars which explode, they send particles, very energetic particles. CERN is nothing compared to this, what the universe is doing. And those particles hit the atmosphere around us and produce radiocarbon. That's how radiocarbon is present here. So a bit more to show this how this is a, 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 um, over Chicago, some people from Chicago here. <laughs> uh, the, the shower of uh, cosmic radiation hitting the atmosphere and uh, one particle hitting it, a proton with this tera electron volts, uh, electron volts uh, which is a huge, huge energy. You see what is created, those uh, uh, green puffs, this is other particles. And I'm sorry I have no pointer, but on the last, very last uh, points maybe, these are thermal neutrons. Those are the agents which create then later radiocarbon. Here I summarize for you what is old, what is young carbon. The old one is that one which was formed uh, in galaxies and it's still here because it's stable. And we are 99% of carbon. You see here C12, C13, these are isotopes of carbon, natural occurring isotopes. They, they called isotopes because they behave chemically identical. They just have a bit different masses. So that's what creates the difference uh, between them. But otherwise they would oxidize to CO2 
and uh, go to the photosynthetic path and become us, become grass, become uh, us. Uh, uh, you cannot see it by eye. And then we have this young radiocarbon, which is the cosmic produced, cosmic radi uh, cosmogenic, we call it, cosmogenic isotope produced by cosmic radiation. And you see in a, uh, instead of percent uh, percentage, I give you 10 to minus 12. This is the teeny tiny amount in us, which makes us young <laughs> on the top of this old. So whenever we later talk about radiocarbon dating, nowadays we measure C14 over C12. So you see that we measure 10 to minus 12 uh, ratios in the best case, sometimes 10 to minus 14 ratios. That's the challenge of radiocarbon. Again, I want to show you this picture and summarize what's happening with uh, radiocarbon, the production of radiocarbon up there, and then the photosynthetic path, you can see the yellow arrow uh, showing how C14, which is already bound to, to oxygen as a C14 uh, uh, dioxide molecule, goes in this ratio, 10 to minus 12, goes into uh, living uh, organisms, to, uh, to, to plants, via photosynthesis. And here is a small uh, site uh, jump. Actually, C14 was uh, discovered for photosynthetic studies. It was in uh, 1940s in Manhattan and Manhattan project. People were looking for tracers to study photosynthesis, and that's how they discovered C14. But this is only site work. We go back to what does it mean for us if we want to uh, use it for, for dating. We, down there, we see the ocean. I have it here because it's important uh, for later when we have our radiocarbon ages measured. The ocean is a big agent influencing our precision. And then you see the Swiss cow. Uh, if it is grass, Swiss grass, <laughs> uh, then it will be as long as it leaves, it will be in, in a steady state with the atmosphere. So it will be also 10 to minus 12 C14 over C12. And then when it dies, we see what happens. We come to this point that it is a radio, radioactive isotope, radiocarbon, and whenever it decays, it changes to nitrogen. It disappears. So in the next cartoon, I will explain to you what that means, that it disappears and how we can use that. This is what I call C14 clock, or any radioactive uh, uh, isotope. Uh, there are many, uranium, thorium, argon, argon. The, they can be used for dating purpose, but none of them is like radiocarbon because none of them can date uh, living, I mean, previously living organisms. So here, uh, the first part you see uh, kind of repeated uh, what I said, that C14 is produced up there in the up, uh, upper atmosphere, and then quickly, relatively quickly, mixed over the, um, around the globe. We say on the level of one to two years. Gets the equilibrium, and all the time it goes into the living uh, organisms, you see the Swiss cow, and then what happens when the Swiss cow dies? We see that it disappears. C14 disappears uh, through this decay, what I showed before, and the curve above shows the, the rule how it disappears. If you see the 50%, <laughs> now I can't really, the 50% is after so-called so half-life time. That means after around 6,000 years, the, if I had precisely uh, drawn C14 atoms in a cow, I would have four 
of them. And then after 5,700 years, there will be in this uh, uh, skeleton, we have only two. So, and the above equation shows you how we can calculate time back. And this is what uh, Willi, uh, Libby did over more than 60 years ago. He kind of uh, set the foundation for this method. He and his students, they got samples, maybe some of you um, know those samples by heart, <laughs> uh, some of uh, Egyptic, some of uh, three, uh, known age trees, that those samples, if you look at the lower scale, they have historical age. And what they did, uh, Libby and his co-workers, they measured remaining radiocarbon uh, remaining in the samples, and so uh, they rep reproduced the exponential decay, what, what you could see on this uh, theoretical curve, the similarity. Here you see this is uh, the equation which we use for calculating our radiocarbon ages. So we have the half-life locked in this 8033, and then AT is what we measure in the remaining some uh, remaining C14 uh, in the sample which, which we collect. A0 is our baseline, what should be in the atmosphere when the cow dies. So these are our assumptions, just briefly to show what, who is using this. And this, is, this shows uh, numbers from my lab, where uh, over the years you see we have mainly archaeology, these are numbers of samples, uh, up to 1,000 for each. And then we have studies of past climate, environmental, but also, as you see, art is, uh, has um, a place here, very important one. So you, you can see what kind of material, this is not all, you know, the, the, the Excel cannot show you <laughs> all the small details, but uh, see textiles, a big share of textiles here. This is probably 2009. Uh, some years is more, some years is less. And if you look at the list listed uh, um, um, on the right, you can see leather, parchment. This is not a very common sample, but nevertheless it's here. You can see also we go for wine, we go for perfumes, we go for pearls as well. So. Mm, that, that's the variety of samples, but this I show just to, to uh, make the connection to nature, because all the samples, even if we have them in a museum, they come from nature. And you can see that uh, in our studies we go back to nature as well, we go to lake sediments. Here is the lake from Switzerland, it was my uh, research uh, study. Uh, 20 years ago. We go for peat, we go for ocean sediments, we can look at the uh, past climate in those records, and uh, corals. Corals has uh, calcium carbonate, and this, of course, has carbon in it. So it doesn't have to go for a photosynthetic path. It can be also uh, carbonates like pearls or stalagmites or corals. And, of course, trees. Trees are very important. Here I show you uh, just pictures of what you can find in nature as well. <laughs> it's nature art. These are uh, seeds of uh, trees. You can see uh, the, um, on the left side uh, the, the birch. Those are 12,000 years old, if you can believe looking at this. And even uh, uh, sometimes you can find older material th that well preserved. And of course, as I said, archaeology is a big part of our uh, research. Uh, we, we get mainly bones for archaeology, so you can see starting uh, preparation of bones. And as I said, wood. Wood can be all kinds of ages. This one is again connection to young. This is a young tree which uh, uh, was uh, studied uh, by, by school, uh, school students uh, for uh, just uh, environmental study. 
And here I have the last example almost of the old, and this is the example which is uh, the end of uh, our, our method, the limit of our net method, 45,000 years BP. This is how far we can go after that. We, don't, we are not able to count those red atoms in skeleton. That means they almost disappear. This is the limit of the radiocarbon dating method. Here you have a mammoth bones uh, in a pit section. So there is not only carbon in bones, but there is a lot of uh, wood in this pit, and there is also the pit is organic material itself. So th this shows quickly, briefly, what we do if we get a sample how the sample goes through the lab and uh, uh, how we get uh, uh, radiocarbon age. So the first from the left going up, because each step is um, a bit more complicated, we start with uh, solvents treatment, which removes any conservatives, waxes, oil. This is uh, actually standard for art pieces, what we do. And then the next step is also removing if we have something like the bones uh, in pit section, we remove whatever environment uh, contamina contamination, that means carbon coming from uh, outside than, than the studied object. And then in the last step, there's pure clean carbon. And here you can see the amount which we need. We need only one milligram of pure carbon. So let's say 10, 20 milligram of textile. This will be burned and turned to elemental carbon. This is because after that it goes down to the machine. It's uh, really uh, literally down because the machine is down. <laughs> and uh, it will be measured in a manner which I show you in the next step. Uh, you see the machine is, uh, I have to make uh, a bit of uh, advertisement for my group, or I'm really proud to be in this group. This type of machines are invented in, in my group and they, they are uh, worldwide uh, beloved because they are small, compact and very precise. The, there is uh, high, uh, high quality data coming out of it. So this is how it works. You see here uh, we have various parts of, of the machine and those curves showing what we want to get at the end. The red one, the first one ending with the uh, mountain, the mountain is C14. In reality it's not a mountain, it's just a few atoms. As I said, we have 10 to minus 12 what we have to measure. So this amount is really teeny tiny. We have to have uh, various filters which on a way, filter out whatever contamination, uh, un unwanted numbers we have. I don't want to go to details on this, just that you see C14 over C12. Here we have uh, young carbon over old carbon. And with this number, we go and calculate our radiocarbon ages. And then I have this. Uh, question about the precision of uh, radiocarbon dating. How precise uh, can this be? We say it can be very precisely measured. You saw that the equipment is there. We are doing this very precisely. But nature made radiocarbon complicated. That means the assumptions which are on the basis of this method, when Libby started 60 years ago, he said, we have to have A0 to be able to calculate, so this must be constant. And then we have our half-life measured at that time. Nowadays, we know that this A0 constant is not true. We know that nature is more than is complicated and A0, that means the C14 concentration is fluctuating as time goes. And a big problem or big challenge is to know how it changed in the time. So we go with our radiocarbon ages, we have to calibrate them. And 
I want to show you how the calibration works and how, what that means. Doing this, we go back to our sister, older sister, <laughs> dating method, which is dendrochronology. Maybe some of you know that dendrochronology can give you time, very precise time, they can do it uh, with enough uh, statistical data, they can do it plus minus one year, or maybe uh, exactly one year. And here this cartoon shows how it works more or less from the tree, uh, from the specific um, um, specific pattern in tree rings, because we know tree rings uh, uh, weave will be dependent on a year, it changes from year to year, and dendrochronologists are able to build chronologies back, putting together fossil trees uh, which are found in a region. So this is a regional uh, curve which can be used for dating. We are using this for uh, calibration. That means we get uh, on a lower calendar time scale in BC or Anno Domini, and then we can sample wood and measure radiocarbon, plot it on a uh, uh, y-x, uh, as you see, C14HBP on the left, and this gives us our calibration curve. See, this is uh, just a cartoon, but there, there's much more samples taken and much, much more uh, uh, work done than this couple uh, stars. But in the end, we have, this is only a portion of the calibration curve. We have a calibration curve based on tree rings going back to nowadays, we're extending this to 13,000 years. So that's uh, really huge work. Here I show you details on this curve. If you, if you look, this would be, the one-to-one -one would be if the uh, radiocarbon clock was a perfect one, if A0 was constant as there, there was the first assumption. Then we would have this one-to-one -one, uh, red line. But you see the nature is different. As time goes, it can go up and down, and sometimes you see those uh, mm, ellipse, blue ellipse showing plateaus. We call them plateaus, or we call them uh, wiggles on a calibration curve. And those are critical. If you want to have precise radiocarbon ages, this is sometimes a bother. Here, again, I want to point out something uh, zero BP is, uh, the, uh, sometimes you see radiocarbon ages with BP, this is before present. Present was 1950. This is by definition, by convention, when the uh, radiocarbon was uh, uh, established. So, that was uh, the basic. We, we have examples of dating old, maybe some of you uh, no, uh, the Iceman found in the Alps. We got the samples soon after the famous people had their pictures taken. We got a bit of uh, his muscles. And this is the result what it's used as a basis for his age. You see in this plot, you see the result uh, of measurement, 4550 plus minus 27. This is a radiocarbon age measured based on counting atoms in the tissue. And then the blue curve shows the tree ring curve, tree ring based calibration curve. What I explained before, on the left, you see the uh, Gaussian distribution of this radiocarbon age. And then calibration means we check where our radiocarbon ages hit this calibration curve. And that's how you get the dark piles below. This is ranges, this is probability, how, uh, how the C14 age corresponds to, to what calendar age it, it is. And here you see the best illustration what the plateaus do to our measurement. Our precise measurement is turned to this very wide range just by nature because the Etsy lived in this time when radiocarbon clock stopped. We say we have this plateau 
and the calendar ages are um, 3400 BC to almost 3, uh, 100 BC. So it's, it's a great loss on uh, precision. Maybe some of you work with Pazirk art and this is another example of a great, great plateau. Here we have uh, tons of organic material. We, have, we can measure precisely radiocarbon ages and they always will be around 2500 BP. Here you have the example of the puzzle crack which we measured at 2245. You see the precision, this is 20 years ago. The precision wasn't uh, as nowadays, but it would not help much. We still have this wiggles, which a kind of wrap us of our precision. So you, you see the effect of fluctuations in radiocarbon um, production, or as I said, the ocean is a big uh, reservoir playing important role. Then I have a Swiss example where the life is a bit easier. It's a document of uh, establishment of Switzerland and uh, 20 years ago there was anniversary, um, more than 20 years ago, and everybody wanted to, 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 to have it precisely dated. Well, we did measure very precise for those times, but you see again, <coughs> here is double pile, uh, double peak, uh, the, the dark uh, distribution underneath uh, of the calibration curve shows that we cannot do better than that because nature made this time complicated radiocarbon wise. So here a bit of art uh, again <laughs> here <laughs> we can debate if one can improve if we can really prove that it was done in the Da Vinci time, the piece which was uh, recently in the news of parchment uh, by accident. Someone emailed me and asked if, uh, if I can do something else as precise as this. And I said, I don't know of any Da Vinci. And then I got a, uh, uh, a copy of uh, this book by, by Kemp and uh, Kote. And uh, you see that here, we have still improved, we could improve the dating results uh, with uh, measurement, maybe, but we are still in a range of, if you see this wiggly part, so maybe it doesn't matter how precise we measure there, because again, nature is complicated. But there are ways around this, and I have here a study which I've done with uh, people in Louvre, and this is a violin where you can count three rings and that's how people date violins. They count three rings and they set the age. Here we attempted to do it with radiocarbon. As you know, the violins are from the time when all of uh, people working with art know it is a Stradivari time. So we always get radiocarbon ages of 160 to 100 years BP and as you see again we have those dark mountains in a time between uh, 1600 and Domini and 1950 we cannot do better because the nature made C14 signature so complicated. In the case of this violin you see three samples and they all have the same ages but we have, if you see here, there are lines, points. We have, we can count three rings in between. And based on this, this helps us to remove some regions of those mountains. The, car, the big picture below shows you how we do it. This is called Bayesian modeling. We can put them together and try to fit on our calibration curve. The result, it's much better than just the mountains as, as we saw before. So I think that was the last of the old and the young is something what might be of interest <laughs> for you. Someone said that uh, there is a bomb peak which is complicated our lives. 
and I want to show you that you can use the bone pick to make your life maybe not easier but uh, more clear. <laughs> we use C14 which was produced in 19 in 50s, late 50s, early 60s, um, there were nuclear tests and the production rate of C14 was artificially doubled. In the atmosphere was created this what you see here, we call it bomb peak. Now I have to guide you a little bit. On the left side is so-called delta C14. This shows us how much over the what we would call the regular normal base of production rate is uh, created. So the peak is over zero. This what is extra is artificial. This went to the atmosphere and is slowly disappearing, almost disappeared now, and everything what lived in the time between 1960 or is living still, <laughs> 1960 and now, we all carry the signature in us. I mean, um, people who were born in 1960, 1963, DNA in brain has the C14 of the time fixed. DNA is a part of an uh, organism which doesn't exchange carbon. Everything else is exchanging. So if, I, if we take a hair sample of of me now uh, will be uh, present-day C14 in the atmosphere. But DNA of my brain is glowing. So, uh, <laughs> you know, it, present, it, it preserves this signature. And also everything what is created from, from trees, from, from wool, from silk, will have the signature. It will have too much of radiocarbon. And that's what we I have a very uh, uh, neutral example, not very arty, but uh, you, can, you can see what that means. The negative radiocarbon ages. We measure too much radiocarbon, we obtain negative radiocarbon ages, and then we can use the data what we have for production of C14 after 1950, we can say quite precisely when the textile, in this case, it's a t-shirt of radiocarbon conference. Uh, we know that it was produced after 1995 because the conference was 97. Uh, we, we can say this is maybe two years of storage of this material. I have just examples, forger examples. If I obtain a sample like this, I cannot say you see a picture on the left, this uh, original sample, how it comes. And then after treatment, what I showed you before, pictures from the lab, it looks like this. Wool, when it's clean, it's almost destroyed by, by base, by, by alkali treatment. And the result you see on the right tells us it's a negative radiocarbon age. This wool, it's not thousand years old, it's something someone produced uh, after 1950. And below it's a funny example of uh, forgery because it's older than 50,000. It's uh, produced of fossil fuels, carbon, I mean coal, oil, everything synthetic is older than 50,000. So you can see even after, t even I can say after textile uh, when it was clean, it, did it didn't look normal because uh, it's not it's not natural textile so I think that's my summary I hope I showed you a little bit of basic for radiocarbon dating and how useful it is in in dating in archaeology and also uh, there is uh, this huge uh, field research of forensic studies environmental studies where radiocarbon is very, very useful tool. Right. Thank you. Well, if somebody has a questions, <coughs> please. Yes. Uh, 
uh, radiocarbon only in the region around Chernobyl, yes. We have, I mean, this is the tracer part. We have um, studies uh, around uh, nuclear power plants where you can see uh, radioactivity in people. I mean, uh, this is really, you know, going into regional studies, but it's not globally. You cannot see this now. Yes? One interesting aspect of radiocarbon dating in art is concerned with wood. Yes. Uh, and if you could explain that just a little bit, because the wood dies. Yes. From yes. The out Ve very. Very good, very good question, uh, because this is actually brings me uh, to, uh, to my mind that I should say we always date material, not the time of uh, uh, creating something. We always say we, we date parchment is nice, but wood has a, a additional problem built in, because wood is always uh, from a tree. And tree can can grow for thousands of years. Well, th thousands. Uh, if you have a piece of art, you don't know where from this wood uh, is taken fr from the tree, which part of tree it is. And the tree rings, as I showed, uh, explaining calibration curve. If the ring is formed, it's like DNA. It's closed. There is no exchange of carbon with the atmosphere anymore. Not, not that we see it, you know, maybe marginal, which is beyond our precision. But uh, so that's the perfect tool for dating. But uh, you have to have some kind of assurance that you are using the last rings of the of the object and. In addition, you have to have assurance that this wood wasn't stored for I don't know how long. This is, uh, this is the, the complication with wood. Wood is, might be tricky. But wood, wood that uh, could be carved later. Yes, can exactly. Can exactly. be carved after 100 years of storage. It's no good anymore for carving. Well, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> this is, no, this is, this is why I came here to learn thing. that. <laughs> yeah. No, this I don't know. I mean, these are very interesting questions how, you know, uh, how for archaeology also, how did people build something, you know? If they built a big cathedral, did they go and uh, get wood from the forest nearby or did they prepare themselves? These are, these are uh, questions nobody knows. And, uh, you know, people come and say, okay, we got this wood dated precisely and we will know how the church was developing and they get a, a part of a huge cathedral a, a, one is uh, from the other six years apart and I say that's not possible I mean in my mind uh, I, I see this as uh, they would pile the wood and they say okay now be, we build the cathedral but we don't know I don't know <laughs> yeah. I think for construction you might use a very st very aged wood. That well, well yeah. No, this yeah, that's that's a that's a good point. Yeah, that for art is totally different. For art, yeah. I yeah. don't think you can wait too long to carve the wood. Mm -hmm. It loses its mm -hmm. qualities. Well, generally speaking, woods are worked out after ten to fifteen years, more or less. Mm -hmm. Most, yeah. mm -hmm. Say ten mm -hmm. to thirty years, you can always. But of course, yeah. makers. Fakers might use woods which are much older. Well, and yes. Yes, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Like, uh, for instance, Han sculpture, which has been recarved yeah. in Ming woods. Yeah. Well, but then the fakers have to be really educated because they have to have this wood in the right time. Yeah. We had old, which even is I was. Often not the case. Yeah, well, you know, this is the question. I. I I would like to hear more about this. What do you think about uh, uh, people who fake art, you know? Because they well, might be possible. educated, you know? <laughs> I, make, I come from Poland, I didn't say that. <laughs> I come from Poland and uh, I studied in Krakow and I go a lot to Poland. There is this movie, uh, Vinci. It's a funny Polish movie 
about this, how the Da Vinci painting, which is uh, in Krakow, was stolen to make them. So I really recommend it <laughs> because you can uh, you can see how you know maybe uh, maybe there are uh, early dedicated fakers <laughs> and Absolutely. educated. Yes. Yeah. Sure. No doubt. <laughs> May I, I admit it, but in your former when you start with 8033. That what? Excuse me. At the beginning. Yes. You show the formula. And you start it with 8033. The formula. Ah, 8033. Yes. What's the reason? Oh, that's the, that's the half-life, uh, wrong half-life. This, I, I didn't want to go. This is the one, uh, the, this is the one which, which Libby, I mean, in a formula with, it's a logarithm of two over. So it's, it's, it's from the decay. <laughs> and then, because if you if you remember this curve, the decay, this is exponential decay. That logarithm will be um, the sol uh, sol uh, solving for t <laughs> with the half life of of Libby. Same logarithm as Libby. As, as uh, Libby. Yes, are, are that's that's exactly. All your calculation of yes. This yes. Okay. All the radiocarbon ages are Libby ages. We we use uh, the the wrong half life because it was uh, used uh, in many datings before uh, the new one was established. Therefore, in the um, 60s, there was a, set, a, conven a convention set that we will do this anyway. A radiocarbon has to be calibrated. That's why we have to use the wrong half-life. I mean, we have to. We, we use it for consistency with whatever was done from the beginning, mm. just for this. And then, uh, since we have to calibrate, and this takes away the, this error. Calibration removes the error because we go, it doesn't matter uh, what half-life uh, we use. We, we, ca we have our experimental curve also measured in the same manner. So that's why. Okay, I, I understand now. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. But when you say there are disruptions in C14 in nature, what does nature do to disrupt this C14? <laughs> because it's a long story, it's yeah. 30 years, I, I, don't, I, I didn't catch Okay, it. I didn't include that. It goes back to this, um, um, maybe I go back quickly, to the cartoon with the cow, because as I said, I have those main, uh, main, <coughs> mm, with the previous. Okay, here. I have the sun. Solar activity is influencing the uh, shielding around the Earth. We are, uh, we are shielded by geomagnetic field and heliosphere, sending the particles which shield us from cosmic radiation. Cosmic particles, very energetic, they will be, only part of them will cross. Otherwise, we would be not here. That's how the sun is here. It's important. Uh, and then down there, geomagnetic field is also changing. We know that. There are times, 40,000 years ago, geomagnetic field all, almost flipped over, as we call aborted uh, reversal. This happened in the Earth history many times, but uh, we, we have indication that, that uh, the, that was not so rec not long time ago as well, and then the ocean here shown because, as I said, it's a huge reservoir. It's 
70 times of what the biosphere has carbon, so it's huge. And in addition, the ocean is taking CO2 in, that's why we are not burning now from fossil fuels, because they all went to the ocean. CO2 is dissolving in water. Uh, going down, it takes 2,000 years for the CO2 molecule to, comes out, to come out of the ocean. Now, all this is connected to climate. So how fast the ocean is giving CO2 out or taking it in depends on the climate. So if it uh, gives out old CO2, makes the C14 lower in the atmosphere, then our radiocarbon ages will be older. If we have more solar activity, we will have more shielding around us. There will be le less particles coming. We will have less carbon produced, the C14 produced and we will have uh, older C14 ages in this time. So that's how nature, and I, I must say, until now no one can tease this apart because the solar activity influences the climate and the climate is connected to the ocean. We don't know how they all, uh, you know. So, but that's a... <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. I have a wooden statue. <laughs> I want to have it dated. Yes. Where can I have it dated? How long does it cost? How much does it cost? I, I have a card. I, I have a card. <laughs> yes. I, I have a card I, I can give you. Or I can tell you this later. Not to take time for. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome.